If you got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Romans this morning. Um, Romans chapter 12, uh, verses 4 to 8. Um, today we're going to be talking about um, uh, 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 the importance of connection and collaboration. That's what we're going to be going. This is part of a, a wineskin that we're building here at Seattle Revival Center. Um, we believe that there's no shortage of wine. And I'm speaking of, of metaphors and analogies here. Um, just in case you're new with us and you're talking, you think we're talking about literal wine. You're like, wow, I really like this church. I, I kind of liked it. But now I'm really, because they're really into wine. But we are talking metaphorically. Wine is symbolic in the Bible for, um, for joy. It's symbolic for the presence of the Lord. We know the very first miracle miracle was when Jesus turned the ordinary. He turned water into wine. And he did it at the end of a wedding. He, he did it when, um, and everybody was baffled. Everybody was blown away because they said at most Hebrew weddings, they bring the good stuff first, okay? And then the more inebriated and the more intoxicated, we're not vouching for that this morning, but, but this, was, this was then, and that was then, and this is now. Okay, um, and so the more inebriated they would get, uh, they'd bring out the cheaper wine last. So they'd start off with the bottles and end up with the boxes, and some of you are tracking. Um, and, uh, but all of a sudden, they ran out of wine. Now, out of wine, that means no more celebrating. That means it's the end of the party as we know it, because we're out of wine. And so, uh, and, and, but, but they weren't ready to be done with the party. And this is just a weird, let, let's be honest, if, if, if this happened nowadays, um, a, a council would say, Jesus, let's just leave this story out of the Bible, um, because it's not very religious. <laughs> That's the thing about Jesus. He's not very religious. Religious. So anyways, um, uh, like everybody, they've had a good time. Trust me, they've had enough wine, okay? And it's the end uh, of the party, and people are somewhat depressed. Um, but guess what? Someone, someone's got an idea. Who's got an idea? Jesus' mom's got an idea. <laughs> She's like, <clears throat> son. And he's like, um, what, mom? And she's like, I know that you can do something about this. And he's like, mom, it's not my appointed time. And she goes, Jesus, get her done. And he goes, okay. Isn't that crazy? That's actually how the story goes. I can't even believe that they put that in the Bible. And so Jesus says, get me a bunch of vessels, fill them full of water. They bring all this water, you know, all these vessels. And then, um, Jesus, and then Jesus is like, okay. Uh, you know, I don't know, you know. Poof. <laughs> you know, and then he's like, go ahead and pour it out. And then everyone is like, like imagine these people. They've had a little bit, uh, they've had... Too much of a good time, and, and, and all of a sudden, you know, they, they, they go to engage with this wine as if it was any other ordinary wine, but all of a sudden something happens. What happens? The aroma happens. Wow. The color happens. They just know that something, something has changed. Something has happened. And, and I don't think they were flippant with this. I think there was a holiness on it. I think, I think it was new wine. I think it was so different. Let me just suggest um, to you that, that many people in the church have been drunk on the wine of religion. And they think they, they, they think they know it all, but they don't really know a lot about the presence of God. They, they know a lot about God, but they don't necessarily um, know him intimately. And let me tell you something. If you've been drunk on the wine of religion, it's time for you to trade out your tradition for a little bit of intimacy. And some people have been drunk on the wine of worldliness, meaning that you are just intoxicated with the way that the world does things. And you just, there's no difference between you and Jesus. Like, 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 it's, it, like you believe in the Holy Spirit, and yet there's not a lot of um, fruit of holiness within your life. And if you've been drunk on the wine of worldliness, um, it is time to get filled with the Holy Spirit. Come on, wave at me now. Because when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, it looks like you're drunk on wine. In that, that's what it looked in. And actually, they said, these guys are drunk on wine. And Peter said, uh-uh-uh. It's only 9 a.m., honey. We are very, very filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is what this means. It's, we have been filled with, with joyful fearlessness. We have been filled with the kind of courage from on high. And so we believe that there's no shortage of wine. There's just a shortage of wineskins. 
What's a wineskin? A wineskin is your, your value system. It is your belief structure. It is your disciplines. It is those things that you're not willing to compromise on. And so we've been encouraging you throughout this series to begin to develop your own personal wineskin. Because how many of you know that, that, that your values might not be the same as my values? There's things that I might be willing to fight for that you might not be willing to fight for. And things that you might be willing to bleed for and die for that maybe I'm just not there yet. Yet you need to take the time to honor your DNA and the way that God has framed you, informed you, so that you can be a good wineskin, so that you can be a good representor of heaven on earth through your experiences, through your talents, through your giftings, through your obedience. He smiles a lot. I know. Ain't he cute? So this is the thing, is that um, uh, Jesus is wiring us in such a way in this time that we will be trustworthy saints with his presence. Amen? Here's uh, what we're going to be studying during our series. Um, expectation, that's week one. Preparation, that was week two. Communication, we spent two whole weeks talking about communication. And today we're going to be talking about collaboration. Um, and then next weekend, well, next weekend is going to, it's going to be kind of crazy. At 9 a.m., uh, Charlie Champ is going to be in the house. At 11 a.m., Bobby Connor is going to be here. And then at 5 p.m., Bobby and Charlie are going to be tag teaming, okay? If you don't have an expression on your face, then we'll do an altar call at the, at the end of the meeting here. Um, when we, you know, and then we're going to uh, finish up this series with evaluation and celebration. Now, let me just say this. Being that it is um, Declaration Week, this is Declaration Week. We should approach this week with expectation and preparation. Here's what I mean. We should begin preparing for Thursday night today. So that when we come here, we don't have a flippant attitude that just says, well, well, whatever happens, happens. No, no, no. We should come here hungry. You know, uh, you, you know like how many, how many, whenever you go to a good restaurant, you make sure that you go there hungry. Why? Because you want for your, your senses to be heightened. I, I want for you to come to Declaration Conference, and this, if this is your home church, then I, I know you're going to be here. And, and I'm not saying that flippantly. I don't think that there's any, anywhere else that we should be as a church but here at Declaration Conference. Why? Because God does nothing unless he first establishes it through his prophets on the earth. And if we're going to partner with what God wants to do for us as a church community, and listen, it's not good just for Darren to be here and then for Darren to try to repeat everything that Bobby and Charlie and Patricia said. Why? Because the words that are being released, they aren't just words for Darren. They're not just words for this house. If you are a part of this tribe, that means that there is a word from the Lord for you. And I'm not talking about just the personal prophetic word. I'm talking about you get into the atmosphere. And I'm talking that there's a, there's a corporate expectation. Maybe some of you have never been to a conference here at Seattle Revival Center. I'm telling you something. You walk into this room before it even begins, and the expectation's electric. You could almost, it, it's thick, it's dense. You could almost cut the atmosphere um, with a butter knife, with a butter knife, that, that, like that's that, that's what that, that, that and, and I'm telling you in that in that place of what is that? What is that expectation? That is faith. That is faith. We we've had people healed in the atmosphere before the meeting even began. We had a woman that was on oxygen for years, and and she came to the meeting expecting. She said, "Tonight is my night for a miracle," and the meeting hadn't even started yet. And she took her oxygen tube out of her nose and began pacing the place. And she said, "Hallelujah! The meeting hasn't even started yet. I'm already healed." She just got in the atmosphere. And so this is Declaration Week. It's time to expect, begin preparing yourself, and begin uh, 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 ready. Communication. Today we're going to be talking about collaboration. We're talking about uh, preparing for and stewarding and sustaining a move of God. And, um, and so enough about here. Let's talk about you really quickly. When it comes to, when it comes to um, uh, collaboration, when it comes to you, you've got a dream you got something um, that you want to do. Um, you've got uh, uh, something that you've um, been thinking about maybe in 2020. How many of you guys got some uh, New Year's resolutions this year? you got some new things you want to do? Awesome, awesome. Some of you, you um, you've, got, you've got a dream that you've been stewarding in your heart for a long time. How many of you, I'm talking to you. There's been something that you've been stewarding in your heart for a long time. 
and uh, just hold your hand up really high so I know I'm talking to someone. And, uh, and you've been waiting, and you've been waiting. And for some of you, you know, you want to go to a new place and do new things. Some of you, you might want to go for a hike in the Amazon. Some of you, you might want to write a song. Some of you, you might want to start a Facebook group. You could do that this afternoon. <laughs> you know, some of you, you want to start a church. Some of you, you want to pray for someone and see them legitimately healed. Some of you, you actually want to pray for a dead person and see life come back into their body and see them walk. You know, um, uh, I believe that, that all throughout this place are people with, um, with, with, with dreams. And, and, um, and yet, sometimes we run into a problem. And, 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 and sometimes the problem is, is that we don't necessarily want to engage these dreams or these prophetic words. Why? Because there's a lot of disappointment in our heart. Why? Because we had a dream in the past, and when we went to go and do it, we found that we, found, we fell straight onto our face. And we were embarrassed, and we went to start that business. We went to start that ministry. We went to do um, that thing, and it didn't, it didn't quite take off. So in that place of embarrassment and in that place of, of, of maybe, maybe there's some shame or, or maybe it wasn't spiritual at all. Maybe it was just natural. You, you went to just go and do something and it didn't work out. And so you said, from this point forward, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play it safe. Because nobody likes to be embarrassed and nobody likes to fail. And for most of us, the reason why we don't obey what the Lord is saying is because there's a fear. And the fear is a fear of Failure. Why? Because we've tried in the past and we've failed. Yeah. And sometimes we say, "Well," and, some, and I've heard this said in the church and in the world that what you need, no, what you need, if you're going to be successful, if you're going to do this thing, um, then you need to be passionate. You got to be passionate. And so, if you failed last time, if you failed that workout routine already, you know it's already it's only. Um, February 23rd, and you had a New Year's resolution to hit the gym, you know, every, you know and, and it's only February 23rd, but you haven't been back to the gym. I mean, you signed up for the membership, but then you just forgot to, to go. <laughs> but you got the membership, right? But just haven't been there yet. You know, like, like, like you know, if, if you got, like, and so then you're being told, your problem, your problem is that you're not passionate enough. So then how do you fix that? Well, then you get onto Instagram, you go hashtag motivation, and you subscribe to fitness motivation, which you shouldn't do. It's basic, you know, it's borderline pornography. But, like, you know, you get, like, you know, you got, you get, you got six-pack abs going up your screen all day. Like, you know, you got to sweat it out. Yeah, you know, and you sing all this, and you're just like, ah, uh, that's not me. Ah, uh, I don't look like that at all. I don't know if I want to look like that at all. Like, you know, the problem is you're, like, you've got to figure all these ways to make yourself more passionate. And I don't think that a lack of passion is necessarily the problem. And then other people would say, and I've heard this even a lot in the church, that your problem isn't a lack of passion. We're, we're, we're too passionate. The problem is a lack of competence. You don't have the knowledge. And I don't think that's necessarily true either. Why? Because everything that we need to have six-pack abs or to be a billionaire, we can find on Google. <laughs> right? So I don't think the problem is uh, a lack of knowledge. If, if, if there's a lack of knowledge, just get, um, get, get, get internet from Xfinity and you'll get, um, uh, just go, go to YouTube and pretty much everything that you need to, to figure something out is on YouTube. So then if, if passion isn't, the, a lack of passion isn't the problem, and if a lack of competence isn't the problem, then what's, what, what's, what's the problem there? Thanks for asking. I think, I think, I think the major problem that a lot of us are facing and really um, uh, 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 going after and really being obedient and really seeing some incredible victories in our health and our spirituality, seeing some incredible victories in our marriages, seeing some incredible victories in, the, in, in our career place, um, uh, uh, snapping out of this place, um, disrupting dysfunctional patterns and creating new incredible vibrant patterns. I think the thing that we're lacking, the problem is an independent spirit. You say, what's an independent spirit? An independent spirit is this place where we have been tricked, we've been duped into thinking that freedom is independence. This place where we think that independence is freedom. And what does that look like? It looks like this place where, um, where we define freedom as, is, is if I can sustain myself and not need anyone, that is freedom. 
If I can be an incredible, prophetic, apostolic, evangelistic, teaching, pastoral Christian and do it without any of you, then I am a free person. Yeah, if I can achieve fitness, health, if I can achieve, you know, the best bod ever, and if I can do it without a trainer, if I can do it without a gym, if I can do it without any, if I, if I can do it without any, like, as long as, if, hey, it, how do I do life and not need anyone, not need my mom, not need my dad, not need, I don't need a stink, I, if I had a dollar for every time I see a Facebook meme that basically says, I don't need a stinking church, I am the church. If I had a dollar for every time I see a, a, a churchy meme that goes somewhere in that direction, I would have a lot of dollars. There is an independent spirit. Now, I'm not talking about a demon, okay? That would be easy. Demons are easy. Why? You just cast them out. I said out. <laughs> you can't cast out an independent spirit. Why? It's not a demon. What is it? It's a disposition. It's a fortress of thought. It's a government that you have built that you are operating underneath. And when it comes to this independent spirit, we make these um, governmental statements that I will govern my life in such a way that I will not need anyone or anything if it is worth doing, if it's really going to be significant. It's worth doing alone. Why? Because people... We'll just screw it up. How many of you? That's you. No, don't, don't, don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. All right. Yep. Yep. Now, when it comes to, when it comes to this kind of belief, this kind of um, uh, 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 thought structure, I, I think that a lot of us wrestle with this kind of, uh, with this kind of thing to one degree um, or another. So this is what I don't want you to do. Right now, I don't want you to think of like someone else. I don't want you to think of your wife or your husband. I don't want you to think of, of a previous pastor. Of course, you're not thinking of me right now. Right? Don't you agree? Like, like I don't want you to think. I want for you to take um, work with Holy Spirit. As we're talking right now, I want for you to work with Holy Spirit with, within your own heart to say, um, have, I, um, have I alienated myself in such a way intentionally because I have been tricked into thinking that independence is freedom. And have I, have I come in because I was taken advantage of in the past, because somebody exploited a weakness and I was in a codependent relationship in the past, have I swung to such a degree that I can be with people but never connected to people? Yeah. Just watched a little rabbit trail here, but if you know me, you'll know it's not weird. Uh, this is what I do. It's two-thirds of my messages. Um, last night, we watched uh, a movie about Mr. Rogers uh, starring Tom Hanks. Um, awesome, awesome movie. You um, should probably watch it. It's called uh, It's a Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, okay? And Tom Hanks plays Mr. Rogers. Um, I was crying before, while well, the titles were going, opening titles were going. I was like, I love Mr. Rogers. I was just thinking, I was raised with that guy, right? And um, Tom Hanks says to this other character, and he's like, you know, you know, what, you know, you know what Martha says, she speaks sign language. And you know the sign for friend, it's, it's that. And at the end, I'm, spoiler alert, at the end of the movie, this, this character goes through this metamorphosis and, and Tom, Mr. Rogers is looking through the glass and, and they, do the, they do the little thing for, you see, at the beginning of the movie, the, the guy that needs to go through some transformation uh, wasn't willing to be linked with anyone. Why? Because of negative things within his own past, he believed that strength looked like independence. All right, everybody there? Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 8. It says uh, this. For as in one body, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if in service in our serving, and the one who teaches in his teaching, and the one who exhorts in his exhortation, and the one who contributes in generosity, and the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. This is what we see Paul saying. 
that, the, that this thing that we call Christianity, it's inescapably corporate. In that, we together are one body. You see that? And this is what this means. That the way that God has wired this thing to operate is in this very diverse, in this very tense, in this very emotionally charged uh, dynamic, in this ecosystem known as the body. That we are, and we just declare one body. That we are one body. That we are one body. And this is what I believe that Paul is saying is our solution, is our solution for breakthrough, is our sustainable, for, uh, is, our, is our key for sustainable moves of God, for a sustainable marriage, for a sustainable business, is the solution would be to develop an honor for healthy interdependence. It, it would be it, it, this place where we do not define freedom as independence, where we don't need anyone, but this place where our fruitfulness would be contingent on our healthy relationships within the body. That it is this place where um, that anything worth doing is worth doing within the context of a kingdom community. Why? Because we are making a pledge to create things that outlive us. To create um, a viable art that outlives just a generation. To create music and, and, and movies. To create churches. To create movements. To catalyze revival movements that last longer than three months. That last longer than five weeks. That last longer than three years. That last longer than 30 years. That I believe that if we want to see God's kingdom come and his will be done, we're going to have to learn to, sh to, to rid ourselves of tradition and to create culture of expectation and preparation, communication and collaboration, knowing this, that God has models and blueprints and, and, um, and strategic uh, 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 ways of doing things that he wants to release onto the earth, but he will not do it through a dude. Because if, if it happens through a dude, it's going to have an expiration date. But if it happens through the body of Christ, it won't have an expiration date. Why? Because it was done the biblical way. It was done the body way. That if it's worth doing, it's worth doing with an honor, with an ethic of let's build this thing at a table. Let's build this thing where there can be some coffee, where there can be some food, where there can be some conversation, where there can be the linking of vision. This is what I love about Jeanette Warman and our aid team. It was created at a table. It was created where everybody was getting to bring their vision. Everybody was getting to dream into something. This is what I love about what Corey Mix is doing with our youth is he's creating a team and he's creating it at a table and he's gathering people to come, not to be volunteers, but to come and to be dreaming dreamers and begin dreaming into something. This is the future of wineskins at Seattle Revival Center. This is the future of children's ministry at Seattle Revival Center. Come to the table. Come and bring your dream. Come and bring some good coffee. Come and bring some good, good, good food. Why? Because I'm not going to tell you what to do and how to do it. I'm going to invite you to come and we're going to collaborate. We're going to dream. We're going to be a part of it. And this is what I know that if I can serve you at your table, I know that you're going to be there to serve me at my table. And I know that we're going to be building something something that's going to last a lot longer than us. Shake, shake at me, wave at me, give me some sort of noises just, just so I can be a, a little bit affirmed in what I'm doing right now because God knows sometimes I get a little insecure. So uh, if we're going to do this, then first of all, the first thing I have for you, first, 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 is to become resolved. Everyone just say become resolved. And that would be to make a commitment because where you have no commitment, you have no authority. And where you have no authority, you will have no influence. And where you have no influence, you're basically just somewhere for the paycheck. Or you're somewhere just to be noticed. You're somewhere. So become resolved. That means that you would, that you would fortify yourself, that you would fix yourself. Listen, don't get married to no one unless you're first resolved. I'm making a commitment that in sickness and in health and poverty and wealth, baby, no matter how bad it gets, you can count me in. I will be with you. 
no matter no, no matter how crazy, like like no matter like no matter where this goes, that I will do my best to better your life. This is my commitment to, to, to my bride. I will do my best to better your life. And I believe because you are marrying me, your life will be better. That is my commitment is, 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 is that, that to see you become more beautiful. You're already hot, but, but in the context of marriage, you will become more beautiful. And I will become more holy that, honey, I'm resolved. I'm making a commitment. Listen, I don't believe that you will bear fruit unless you put down some roots. I do not believe that you will be fruitful here at Seattle Revival Center unless you become resolved and you make a commitment and maybe God's not called you here that's cool find a church find an assembly find a community and put down some roots to become resolved if we're going to see moves of God on the earth we've got to see leaders at tables that are making a mutual commitment that no matter how crazy no matter how weird no matter we are in it we are in it stinking together and we will hear from it we will work together we have made a commitment just declare commitment commitment. Now, here's the thing. If you're getting dizzy right now, okay, pay attention to that because whenever I, there's been times that I've preached on commitment in the past and people say, Pastor Darren, whenever you said that word commitment, I felt nauseous. W what is that? that? That is oftentimes that is, that is a demonic influence trying to keep you from fruitfulness and what he's trying to do is he's trying to trigger you and use this word because of a painful episode within the past. It's important that you pay attention to those areas when all of a sudden when you start to get anxious and you, start, you read something in the Bible and you're like, I don't, I can't, I can't, I can't. Yeah, that we pay attention. And listen, this is the other thing, is that if you've been here at Sierra Vital Center three years, six years, nine years, and no one really knows you, and you don't really know anyone, anyone and you're not really involved here, and, and if you were to leave here, nobody would even know, okay, that's not Seattle Revival Center's fault. And, and, and it's easy to make an accusation or blame Seattle Revival Center culture. And I can tell you there are imperfections within our culture. But we are resolved to creating a culture where you can be equipped and empowered and released into your identity and your destiny. But you have to be the one that becomes resolved. And you have to be the one that says, I will, I will overcome all the hurts of the past and I will overcome my own issues that I have with this place that it's not about what's happened or what hasn't happened. I am stinking resolved because God, you've called me here. Yep. No commitment, no partnership. No commitment, no covenant. No commitment, you'll just be a sideline critic while other people get to play. Find your team, find your tribe, make a commitment, say, coach, you can count me in. Yeah. Darren, that was good. Thanks. Awesome. Number two, become involved. Everyone just declare, become involved. Yeah. So you make this commitment, and then you become involved. And that means what? You begin pouring out your heart, and you begin taking the time to listen and to love. To listen and to love. It doesn't mean you just go right into duty mode. It doesn't, that becoming involved doesn't mean that you just start working yourself to death. Come on. This is not a sermon on um, uh, volunteerism. This is not saying you should sign up for something today. What I am saying is that if you make a commitment to Seattle Revival Center, what you should do is start having conversations where you're asking questions, and when you start getting the answers, you would lean in with your heart, and you would learn to listen and learn to love. That goes back to what we talked about last week with communication. Because it's important that you understand the culture of your marriage. And the only way you'll understand the culture of your marriage is if you're learning to listen to your spouse and you're learning to love your spouse. And no matter how long you've been married, there's still a lot more to learn. There's still a lot. Let, let us together, let's make, let's make a pact. Let's make an agreement right now at Sarah Wilson that if we call this place home, we will never become professors. We'll always remain students. Students of love. Students in the kingdom. Lest we come into this place one day where we think we know it all, and it's all in our head, but we're lacking and starved in our own hearts. 
What are you trying to, what are you trying to learn right now? What, what, where, where, are you, where are you leaning in with your heart right now? Has it been a while since you've listened from your, from your heart? And the, and the last thing I have for you is the major key is trust. If we tie this whole thing up, the major thing that we have to address is trust. I want to show you a scripture verse here. This is out of Romans um, uh, chapter 3, verse 5. It says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. This is, where, this, is, this is where this whole entire journey begins. It begins with a question, and the question is this. Do you trust your father? Do you trust the Lord? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And I think that as long as we're trying to figure out how to trust each other, but we're not yet trusting in the Lord. All we'll do is spend the rest of our lives trying to hack the dynamics within our own soul, but we'll miss, we'll miss out on an incredible opportunity to develop intimacy with God. And we can't really develop deep intimacy with people until we first develop an intimacy with God the Lord. Yep, this is your year in 2020 to connect with people, but not until you learn how to connect with your Father. That you are created in the image and likeness of God. Start with God and then move on with man. When God teaches you something about himself and he begins to teach you about yourself, then take that revelation and begin to process it with people. But don't begin with people. Why? Because wherever you begin, that is your confession of your true functional Lord and Savior. So if you're striving in order to find breakthrough relationally, it's possible that the fear of man is your primary God and functional Savior, and that the fear of the Lord is nowhere necessarily on your list. Let's begin with the Lord. Let's begin with working things out with God. You say, I don't trust people. That's okay. You know, join the club. I've been there, done that, bought the t-shirt, okay? It's like, don't worry about your your lack of trust in people. Let's learn to trust the Lord. Let's just declare this out loud. Jesus, teach me how to trust you because I don't want to do life without you. Jesus, I give you my trust issues. I want to know you so I can know others. Isn't this your desire? This is, this is, this is my desire. Because listen, no, 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 no. <laughs> you're not going to collaborate with anyone if you don't trust anyone. You're not going to sit down at a table and invite, are you kidding me, invite people into your ministry, invite people into your business idea? Let me tell you something. The biggest mistakes I have made I made because I forgot that we are a body and I thought that I possessed the passion and the competence to execute the mission. I had forgotten that we are a body and that anything worth doing is worth doing within the context of friendship and trust. I launched a radio show back in uh, 2017 and 18. It was the only radio show um, on uh, Seattle's Alternative Talk that was a gospel-centered uh, show. It's an interesting radio station. They got pet psychics on there. They got, you know, they, they, they got all, all kinds, you know, if you want to know what a pet psychic is, it, it's, it's basically somebody that can tell you what your dead pet is thinking about you in the present. <laughs> they would actually channel the spirit of your dead pet and tell you, like, how good of an owner you were, you know. That one time when you forgot to feed me, I forgive you, ah, you know. My, my show was the only show on there that was, you know. And here's the thing. I thought that I had the, the, the passion and the competence to do it. And we did it. We, we had a lot of fun. But I built it around my, own, around my own gift mix. And because I didn't build it at a table, there wasn't a wineskin where the show could be sustainable. 
And if I had slowed down, if I had included my friends, if I had included my community, and if I would have taken the time to ask a question, how can this be sustainable, then we could have figured out a structure where that could have been. So now, you're like, well, Darren, it's not like, you know, I, like, I don't need necessarily comfort. That radio show was a gift from God. Why? Because God needed to shake me out of my independent way of thinking. And because I didn't get to continue contract with that radio show, I can tell you this, and Anthony can tell you this, and our team can tell you this. As we went into 2018, the way we did team here radically changed. Now the team did not just exist to support Darren's vision. Now it was Darren sitting at a table saying, let's work together, let's collaborate together to the degree where I can hardly put together a sermon series anymore without having a three-hour coffee with Pastor Anthony. Why? Because why, like, because now, doing things alone kind of sucks. If you've got a dream and you're serious, if you've got a passion and you're serious, if God's calling you to do something and you're serious, you're first going to need some friends. And the first friend you need is Jesus. Let's stand. We need more than knowledge. We need a commitment. We need to become resolved in our commitment to say that no matter what, this is who I am and this is what I'm doing. Can we do this just so that no one's embarrassed? I wanted, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you, some of you, to make a commitment today. So if everyone could just bow your heads and close your eyes. Um, and then I'm going to say a, a prayer and then I'm going to get you out of here because we've got 11 o'clock and, and they're getting feisty out there. <laughs> I just saw somebody like hit the door really hard with their body. They want in. Okay. All right. Don't look at me. All right. If you're, if you're here and you're like, Darren, I've been flirting with Jesus, but I am not married to him. I have not been resolved in my commitment. I've been religious, but I don't know God. If that's you, if you'd be so brave with no one looking at you, I want you to put up your hand really high and say, I want to make a fresh commitment to Jesus. God bless you. Just hold up your hand. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. You say, I, I am done with dating Jesus. God bless you. I want to make a fresh commitment. I want to be married to him, meaning that there ain't no going back from, from this day forward in sickness and in health and poverty and in wealth. No matter what I face, I will not do it alone. I will do it with him. I want you to hold up your hand. God bless you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. God bless you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Awesome. Now, awesome. God bless you. Hands all through this place. Now, let's, I, I want to lead you in a prayer. And, and the word, it says, that if we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, he'd be faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins. And so we're going to do this all together. If you just repeat after me and just say, Jesus, I believe in my heart. I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. Forgive me of all my sins. Wash me with your water of the word and with your blood. I give you my past. I give you my present. I give you my future. Now just go and hold out your hands just in front of you and just by faith see Jesus coming to you and just see him giving you his heart because there's a covenant that, that's being made. There's a place that 2,000 years ago Jesus chose you. 2,000 years ago he died for you. 2,000 years ago he made up his mind, you know, and, um, and, and today you are making up your mind. And so if you have prayed this prayer, just receive by faith right now the precious gift of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Right now, right now, just receive the precious gift of the person of the Holy Spirit. Right now, right now, right now, right now, right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And with this, receive by faith a new friendship 
with God, that I am no longer a slave to fear, but I am a son, I am a child. I am a child of God. And if you've prayed this prayer today, I want to welcome you into the family of God. I want to welcome you uh, as a child of God. And I want to declare over you, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. Now listen now, um, when you sin, and you'll notice I'm saying when, you don't need to get saved again, that he died for all of your sins, your past, your present, and your future. So you need to know this. He's already chosen you. You've already, so when you sin, don't run away from him. Run to him because he will always be faithful and just to forgive you. That when you sin, he doesn't reject you. That all he has are open arms towards you. You are a part of the family of God. Don't ever doubt it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.